Adam, how are you, brother? Yeah, very well, thank you, Chris. How are you? Yeah, firing, mate. Firing. I'm Good. really excited for, for our chat because um, I, people will get sick of me saying this, but the reason I started my podcast is to chat to fascinating people who do stuff mm. that I would like to do or may, maybe I've done. Funnily yeah. enough, you might not believe this, but I have done the bobsleigh. Have you really? Yeah. <laughs> I, I say it tongue in cheek because I did the tourist. Uh, the old but, taxi bob. Yeah, it, but it was still, you know, it was still the full on experience. Not obviously we weren't pushing the thing down the slope. And yeah, I think I think that to get as many people in as possible, they we only went from halfway. But <laughs> um, I'll try and put the video clip in our in our in our podcast because the guy kept saying, what have you got your camera out for? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no nothing, nothing. And then as soon as he wasn't looking, I took the camera back out. And he's like, you, I thought he asked you, why did you have your... I was like, oh, I'm just making sure it's turned off. And then as soon as, as, soon as we got down, um, started going down the slope, I took it back out again. And then by the time I managed to get it on record, that was it. It was over. <laughs> we, That's we, unfortunate. But... um. Let's just let's um, take it from the beginning and see how you went from joining the corps into being a bobsleigh pilot. Um, yeah, over to you, mate. Yeah, so I mean, bobsleigh really has come about from off the back of playing rugby and powerlifting. So when I was sort of fifteen years old, back up in Yorkshire, when I got my first job, part of the job was uh, I got a free gym membership. And the gym membership was at the local powerlifting gym where my big brother was training anyway. Uh, and the owner of my sort of work establishment, her brother owned the gym. So I got involved with all of those. And I was basically a very young, skinny, scrawny lad thrown in the deep end with the big powerhouse units doing, uh, doing powerlifting club. So from there, I, I, uh, they realized I was actually quite strong for my weight and sort of age so I started competing uh, I was doing really well I got um, I think my first competition I got a couple of junior records up in Ashington uh, that's not far from Newcastle uh, and then I later on became British champion and I got British record as well which I think still stands I'm not too sure um, and then I joined the Corps in 2008 put powerlifting on the backbone uh, on the back the back step because it's sort of not very good for yomping around and running around the bottom field and your speed marches. Uh, passed out training, got into the rugby team pretty much straight away. Uh, and then I started doing a few Navy powerlifting competitions. Um, and then in 2017, uh, one of the lads was like, you need to come and have a go at bobsleighing. Um, I was like, nah, you're all right. That's, do you know what I mean? Because that's pretty much the usual sort of British uh, thought process on bobsleigh. Like, because it's not a, a usual sport that we, we do out here. So I sort of like, nah, left it a year. And then he was like, mate, you need to come do it because you're sort of like the prime athletic ability to come bobsleigh. So I gave it a go and I've been doing it ever since. It's an absolutely fantastic sport. Wow. So, yeah. <clears throat> Adam, can I just say, for the sake of people listening on our headphones, try not to tap anything because it... it yeah, yeah. <laughs> it will drive people mad. Um, yeah, no problem. So... Before you did that, did you have to, um, did you have combat experience or, or did you? Yeah, so I went, I went to uh, Afghanistan in 2010 with Charlie Company 40 Commando. Uh, that was Herrick 12. That was quite a tasty tour. Um, that was my first tour and I didn't know any different and I still sort of don't really know any different, but people sort of who have done multiple tours are like, that was the most horrific thing we've ever done. Um, but I, me as well as a, you know quite a lot of the young lads that were on that tour were just sort of we were just doing our job basically we didn't know any different we didn't know it was actually a, a bad horrific tour for whereas we thought it was just part of the parcel 
Um, so yeah, that's that's was all my combat experience, and then I've, I've done various other things like humanitarian aid um, on the border of Turkey and Greece a couple of years ago, uh, fishing out the uh, refugees um, who were trying to cross into Europe, uh, get, saving them really, little families and the um, and the guys coming across in the little rubber dinghies, uh, and then done quite a lot of sport to be honest. I mean, majority of my time in the corps, I've sort of tried to play sport at a very high level. Um, so I've, I managed to get myself into the senior Navy rugby league team, uh, rugby sevens for the core, rugby 15s for the core. Been away to America a couple of times. Uh, yeah, I've done quite a bit of sporting, to be honest, which is which is good, to be honest. Well, they always say that in the core, don't they? Get involved in a sport and then because you automatically get the time off to train. And Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do get quite a lot of time off, to be honest. And I'm, I'm literally in the sort of process of, becoming a going on the elite athlete scheme for the Navy uh, which they're just sorting out now and um, so then I'll be full time so I'll be able to train uh, and sort of get my funding um, all squared away without having to worry about going going on exercise going away with work that kind of stuff mm. so I mean the end goal essentially is an Olympic Games and be competitive at the Olympic Games I can't you can't do that with a full-time job it's just impossible when a, when a commander unit, like 40, goes to, was it, is it Op Herrick, isn't it, is Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah. Um, is, it, is it just that commander unit, or do all the Marines commander units go over there? Well, it depends, really. I mean, it depends what battle group you're in. So, so I mean, I think off the top of my head, Afghanistan, there was sort of 4-5 and 4-2 went together in, as part of a battle group, and then four, when, on my tour, I... I believe we were the only commando group out there uh, other than sort of like commando logistics who were doing sort of the logistical uh, nightmare of resupplying everyone in the battle group. Uh, but yeah, we were the only commando unit out on Herrick 12. Because mm. I was talking to a very nice chap last night, Chris Dangerfield. Mm. And uh, he's a comedian, a sort of social commentator. Hello, Chris, if you're watching. Chris, just check out his YouTube tube channel, everybody. And he was fascinated. He, he said, um, what's combat like? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, from, from our Northern Ireland, not Northern Ireland experience, which was pretty full on back in the day, it's such a natural progression from when you first go to the recruiting office and you do your pull-ups, then you go into PRC or PRMC as it is now. Then you get yeah. a letter to say, right, can you go to Limston next week or next month? And then you do the challenges in, in training and then you come out and you go to your commander units, you're expecting to go and fight. I said, it's just what we do. You do. It's not like a big, yeah. right, I'm in combat, freaking heck. It's, yeah. it's like a pro, 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 progression. And then when the rounds start coming down or things start going bang, yeah, it's quite an eye opener, even as a trained Marine, isn't it? But yeah. How was it for you? Oh, I remember, I remember my first contact I was in. Um, we got caught in a wadi right in the open ground doing a sort of, doing a, an assurance patrol. Um, and this was like mega in the early day uh, of like the first few weeks of, of tour. And uh, I remember getting shot at and it was literally a crack and a whiz and it was so loud. So it must have been, you know, metres away from me. And uh, I just think it, Oh shit, we're getting shot out here. Take cover. <laughs> you know, so that was, and then we started returning fire and we actually got a bollock in for throwing the rounds down too much. But as it progressed in the tour, it got so kinetic and dangerous. We were, we were just having to fight everything. Um, yeah, it, it went from sort of real quiet at the beginning. And then at the end of the tour, it was just mayhem. There was so much fighting going on, it was ridiculous. And it wasn't just us. We were getting initiated. We, they were initiating it on us. So, I mean, it was very rarely we would initiate a firefight. It was, it was always them who would ambush us uh, or, or fire at us first. Is it true they're not particularly good shots? Um, in my personal opinion, they're cowards of the Taliban. Um, they'll they'll fire around the corner if they see you come in. They'll fire around the corner and run off as soon as they can. They won't take a controlled shot unless they're the sniper that comes out on intelligence, which I very rare believe actually exists. I think they're just fifteen 
dollar Taliban kids or or people who need a bit of money to fire a few rounds at you, to be honest. Mm. Uh, unless you get the, the nitty gritty hard guys who are who go around in the groups, you know, go around the local farmers and taking the money. They're the, they're the they're the proper Taliban really who um, who do the ambushes and all that kind of stuff on you. But um, no, nah, I think I think if anything, they're very good at building bombs. Uh, as you know, you've probably seen in the news. Uh, that is their main forte: is, is building improvised explosive devices and hiding them in the ground. They are classic. You know, there's no two ways about it. They are very good at it. And every sort of Herrick, they learn <clears throat> sort of countermeasures from our countermeasures, finding the, the uh, IEDs, and they'd use less metal content, all that kind of stuff. And it's just because it's like they've obviously invested a lot of money in science into into how they can combat this. To be honest, mm-hmm. but yeah. That's that's the main the main thing is in Afghanistan was the mines. So do they know then when there's a drone overhead? Do they have ways that can you hear do, it, for example? As soon as you as soon as you walk out the front gate of your compound fob uh, base or anything, they know you're on the ground because they've got they've got spotters. It's a bit like uh, the Mexican drug cartels. You know they've got spotters everywhere, straight on the phone. That's exactly what the Taliban are like. Mm. They know as soon as you walk out the, the patrol base, and because we've got the the uh, because of our interpreters have the comms to listen into theirs because they just use uh, airwave radios like what the police use. Um, you could hear them talking. Oh, they've just left the base. They're walking down here, going down there. You know, they're t- taking a left here. <laughs> you can never see them, you know, unless you actually spot someone on a radio. Dickie and me used to call it. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I was going to say, do you call them dickers? That's what we yeah, call yeah. them over the water. Yeah. And, they, and they also use some really chad um code words don't they like, uh yeah what yeah oh what was they used to use some stupid terminology that was like the big bang stick or something for like an rpg and some daft stuff mm. green eyes for when you're walking out with your uh, mvgs on and stuff yeah was, some, some of it was quite funny actually but yeah when the interpreter used to, to say oh they've got the big bang stick <laughs> But they never did. Or well, they very rarely fired an RPG as because they were so close quarters, to be honest. So you said you got into the bobsleigh through powerlifting. Yep. So was that a civilian thing apart? It start, yeah, it started off civilian. So before I joined the Corps, like I said earlier, I was sort of like 15, going to the local gym as a civilian uh, before I joined the Corps, competing in powerlifting. Um, and then I sort of progressed carried it on after I passed out of training, doing a few bits and bobs in the gym. Uh, then I saw there was like a competition for the Navy, went to that, uh, and then sort of kind of gradually got back into it. I always kept up with my strength because uh, I was always naturally like freakishly strong in some lifts. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that's where it's come from. Uh, and then obviously powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting now is part of my program. It's a massive part of my program. So can you tell us what, what was it like the f- or how do you build up to actually hopping in the bobsleigh and going down the slope? Do you have to do a load of training first? Do you have to sort of prove that you're at a certain level? Yeah, I mean, so so last year, beginning of last year, I went to do GB trials. They put a trials on for development pilots. And so I went and did that. I did really well. And essentially, it was sort of getting tested on a third meter sprint, your push track ability which is pushing a roller bob on sort of train track wheels a bath um so you were timed from the first gate to the to whichever gate they chose and it was the time time basically how fast you can go from a to b basically um so yeah there was that but as part of this sort of training process when you're not on ice it is literally <clears throat> sprinting and weightlifting uh, and then a hell of a lot of recovery and eating as well obviously um but then obviously when you get on ice, it's your ice training, it's your driving, it's your pushing together as a team. You know, all these variables that come together to make a good, basically, start time and a good drive down, down the track. When you were doing this pre, pre-build-up training, was, was that in the UK or was that in the, um, in the mountains? No, so all off-season, we call it, uh, is all back in the UK. Uh, unless you get enough funding, um, well, because COVID's hit, it's kind of naffed everything up. So essentially, they were going to try to put a warm weather camp on 
Um, I don't know where it was in Spain or Italy or wherever it was going to be, but that got basically put on hold. But it was sort of a, a week away, all together as a team, uh, training with physios, all that kind of stuff, um, focusing on your sort of sprints, your push trolley. Um, and I think there may have been an indoor ice push track available as well. <clears throat> um, but obviously that got put on hold. So literally everything is in the UK. Uh, either with your own personal coaches at home in your gyms or at Bath University uh, on the push track. And what, what, how do you find what position you're going to be in a bobsleigh? How does that work out? So the natural progression is to start in the back as a brakeman because no one's ever going to know if you're, if you're going to even going to enjoy bobsleighing, let alone be able to progress to be a pilot. Um, so they'd never throw someone in the front seat to drive a bobsleigh if they'd never been on ice before. That's just mental. Um, so, for instance, for me, I went to Lillehammer for my first one in 2017, which is the inter-services. Uh, went there, was a brakeman, um, absolutely loved it. And then the year after, John Jackson, who's the uh, bronze Olympic medalist and a Royal Marine sergeant, or colour sergeant now, uh, he messaged me and said, you're getting in the front seat next year. Um, and that was partly because I was a little bit too small to be a brakeman because the brakemen are naturally the big old units, powerhouses on the back, uh, and they run the furthest as well. So I gave driving a go, absolutely loved it. It is definitely the best seat in the house on a bobsleigh because uh, you get to control it, but you've got a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility on you to not only get to the bottom of four runners, but you've got to your brakeman has to trust you enough to one, push your sled with you and two, trust that you you can get down because it's quite a dangerous sport. And if you're no good at driving, you're really going to hurt your, uh, your brakeman in the back because it's just metal and fiberglass. So yeah. for every time you, every time you tap a corner or a straight or a wall or anything, you as a driver feel it sort of a little bit. He feels it big time in the back, mm -hmm. especially when he's got his head between his knees as well. How adds? How does he actually brake? What what's the brake mechanism? Um, so both in two man and four man, there's sort of a two handle um, brake in the back, which is right at the back. Uh, obviously, two man is the guy behind you. Four man, it's the rear guy number four, and it's sort of two handles uh, either in, in between your legs or some four mans uh, on the side, um, outside your knees. Uh, and basically, it's on like a pivot motion. So as soon as you pull it, it pushes teeth through a hole in the in the ice. Mm. And that is it. And you literally just hold it there. Obviously, with four-man, you've got to pull it a lot harder than a two-man because of the weight, the, uh, the speed that you'll be going, which is a hell of a lot quicker than a two-man. Um, you've really got to be pulling on those on those brakes. And does will he have to <clears> break? <throat> Obviously, in an ideal scenario, you don't want to break going going down. What do you call it? Yeah. The luge or, or the the? What's the actual track called? It's just called a track. The track. It's yeah. called a bobsled track. Yeah. So when you're going down the track, are you having to shout to him break, or is it like no, you don't break going down? So after you've pushed off and you've jumped in, you are not allowed to break anywhere on the track until the braking straight, which is when I shout break. Uh, and if some some uh, some brakemen are that, are that uh, experienced, you don't even have to turn to shout break. They just they're up straight away because they know the corners of the track. They know where they are. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you pull a if you pull the brake on a corner or on a straight, um, obviously safety implications. That is mega dangerous, especially going around a corner. Uh, not only for yourself, but for someone else coming behind you on the next run. Um, yeah, you. It's absolute no go. You're not allowed to pull a brake um, whilst going down the track unless it's the braking strike. Is that because it's just going to throw the bobsleigh out, or is it because it damages the track? Possibly both. It, well, for one, it definitely damages the track. Uh, if you crash in a bobsleigh, you'll see the track workers jump in the track and they've got buckets of like slushy ice, which they sort of, um, sort of plaster like a plaster motion, uh, fix the track with any gouges or anything to bring it back to a smooth finish. Yeah, got you. And when you say the braking straight, is that like the end? Is what? We yeah, so it's, it's literally straight after the last corner. 
uh, last corner, then there's a timing gate, which gives you your finish time. And then it's usually a massive uphill. Some are, some are shorter, some actually have a bit of a breaking straight and then another corner and then more of a breaking straight, which uh, for a place like Eagles, which is a really easy beginner track, they have a breaking straight like that, which is actually quite a hard breaking straight. Um, Koenigsee, which is where we had our um, the last into services, uh, that's just a nice finish curve, timing gate, nice long straight, uh, up, up breaking straight, which I mean, the clues in the name it should be called a breaking straight for a reason. Uh, and it's nice to big uphill. So you slow down naturally, but you also do need to pull the brake on, especially if the ice is uh, very cold and fast. Mm. You definitely need to use the brakes. When you're over there <laughs> training, do you sort of get out on a pair of skis as well? Do you do, you do other stuff or is it very focused? So I bought a, a new snowboard a few years ago and I still haven't used it. Um, no. One, it's, it's a bit like saying to me, are you still going to play rugby? Well, I can't really because I'm trying to compete at bobsleigh, which is a higher level than what I was playing at rugby. And if I get injured playing rugby, that's my bobsleigh career sort of done for, for at least a season or a few months, uh, potentially for forever if I break something badly. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I probably will give skiing a go or snowboarding. But I won't be, I'll be very careful with myself. I won't be throwing myself down the slopes like what I probably used, used to do. Mm. Uh, just purely for, for being scared of hurting myself, to be honest. Have you, have you boarded before? <clears throat> yeah, I, I used to board all the time. Uh, I, I sort of would try to go out um, snowboarding at least once a year. Mm. Uh, so I've done quite a few snowboarding trips around the, uh, around the old pieces. Yeah, I found with, I found with snowboarding... That very first day when you're learning, it, well, it's about three days, isn't it? You're on your ass. All Possibly the worst three days of your life. Oh, so it goes through your mind, why have I paid for this? <laughs> and, but there's a thing with snowboarding, isn't there? Unless you commit to the turn, you won't make it. You, you know, no, no. Un unless you are, and for people at home listening, commit to the turn means you've got to be pointed downhill. That board isn't going to turn. You've yeah. got to point downhill, start picking up speed, and you gently, whichever way you look and lean, you gently bring the board around. Yeah. And, and it takes, you know, it takes a bit of bravery. It's in many ways, it is a little bit, learning how to ski is sort of very similar to bobsleigh. As soon as you get in that bobsleigh, that's, you're getting down that hill in, you know, either on four runners or on your ass or on your head. You know, once you get off that ski lift at the top, unless you're walking down, yeah. you know, you've got ski down. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's kind of similar. Um, I'd say bobsleigh is probably a lot harder, mm. <laughs> for sure. Because I found with the snowboarding now, I've just got to the level where I don't actually fall over. Uh, in fact, you always unless fall Unless you over. push yourself. Where if I fall over, it's doing something really silly like trying yeah. to put a small turn in when you're going too slow. It's, it's yeah, something yeah. like that. When I'm going fast, I'm too scared to fall over. I just, mm. and I think that limits me in my speed. I mean, I got a friend, he'll point his snowboard down a hill and just and go, over it. he'll just go yeah, all yeah. the way down. Obviously you're not on one edge, which is precarious enough on a snowboard. You know, you, a flat snowboard can be a dangerous yeah. Thing because you've only got to catch that edge and bang. Yeah. You have on your five, face or on your ass. Yeah. And your wrist can only take so <clears throat> so much hit in the ground, can't they? I found it my um, my coccyx was the worst one, falling over backwards every time, and obviously banging on your coccyx and then your head hitting the and the, the snow and ice. That was the worst bit for me. Um, yes. I'm I'm not so bad on the snow. I'm, I don't fear I don't fear it at all because I've done it now for ten years or something. But um, it's the martial arts that I have steered clear clear of because I like running, and you've only got to rip the cartilage in your knees once, and that's it. Yeah, and you're not running. It, it takes yeah. years to heal, if not. Um, I've got two torn. Um, tendons in my knees now right or cartilage i can't remember the name the meniscus i think it's called mm. and it's taken um 
gosh, it's coming up for two years now and they're still not fully, fully, fully healed because I didn't want to have the um, operation. But uh, yeah, so getting back to your point, I, I, I get it. When you've got the golden calf, you don't want to... You don't you, lose it. Uh. You don't want to compromise yourself in any way. What's the... Um, What's the build quality now on these machines? Because how, how's that progressed over the years? Well, I mean, if you if you Google bobsleigh sort of, uh, sleds through the years, they used to have their steer, literal steering wheels, no sort of cowling or shell is what we call it. Um, and now it's progressed to a full body where your whole body is actually hidden within the, within the sled. Some of them are built out of fiberglass, carbon fiber, uh, they've got really good sort of bomb-proof chassis to them. Uh, the steering's really good on them. I mean, I mean, it depends on how much you want to spend on a sled. You know, uh, some two-man bobsleighs, brand new, are fifty-two thousand pounds. A four-man, you're looking at upwards of a hundred thousand pounds. And that's before you've some countries get hold of them, brand new, and then go put their turbocharger on it, which is their sort of science team who try and make it a little bit quicker and work out ways of becoming the best in the world uh, for instance the germans they've got uh, they've got like a state sponsored um sort of sled manufacturer called fes and um they're well they're, they're the best in the world um and frederick their their lead guy nobody can catch him uh, literally nobody can catch him and he sort of wins races from second um the time difference between first and second sometimes is nearly a second um wow. he's just yeah he is just outrageous also teamed up with the fact that he has got one of the best pushers, if not the best push in the world, uh, which massively helped. But yeah, his, his kit is just untouchable at the moment. Do your shoes have spikes on then? Yeah, yeah. so I should have got them from the shed actually. Um, so I've got some set of Adidas uh, sort of white, ridiculous looking um, spikes and underneath it, uh, the actual toe, toe edge of it has got sort of 300 tiny little spikes in it. It's not like um, sprint spikes or cross country spikes. Uh, these are tiny little, tiny little spikes, and there's hundred rows of hundreds of them. Mm. Uh, so we use those to uh, to work on ice work, basically. Gosh, can you explain how how many teams do you drive for or pilot now uh, with respect to the military and civilian? So I'm part of the GB development team as a driver. Um, trying to work up into a senior squad in the next couple of years and then potentially Olympic Games. Uh, but I'm also uh, the Navy number one driver as well. Uh, so I'm Navy champion this year uh, and I'm sort of like their lead driver as well. Yeah, just, just so we, we um, give you your full credit. What, what, and I was, I've been reading your profile. What, what's the championships you've won with the Navy? Or, or you've you've done really well in. Um, so, obviously, I started driving two years ago. Last season, um, I was best novice driver, uh, and then the season just gone. I, um, I sort of because I did my GB trials, um, I sort of progressed quite a lot, like a hell of a lot, and I went from tenth at the inter services to second, um, with first place being the GB two driver. Um, we did. Navy Unit Services, uh, which I came first in um, by ever a second. Um, and then um, the Inner Services, uh, which is the second race. Uh, I came second overall out of, I think, 15 sleds, maybe. Um, so, yeah, I did, did pretty well. And that was the top the top three were all international, well, top four were all international athletes as well. Um, two of which, well, three, in fact, I was the only one who didn't have a world-class sled. The others had very expensive world-class sleds and I still managed to come second. Wow. Congratulations. Oh, um, what, how is it then with PUSA? PUSA for people at home being, uh, being the Navy or at least the Navy supplies. How is it with them like getting you the good gear? Is, is there a limit on what they'll spend? Um, so we got given a grant last year for the Navy and traditionally, the Navy haven't had the best kit out of the whole services. Um, so we got quite a decent grant last year, and we bought a couple of sleds off GB, um, which weren't at the level of world-class, but were 
pretty good for the inter-service level. Um, they definitely put us back in the game. Uh, and it showed because we are the Navy are inter-service champions two years in a row. Um, so it's definitely helped us. Um, so, yeah, we've got, we've got some decent kit in the Navy now. Um, I went out last year and bought myself a set of world-class runners, uh, which cost me £5,500. But I needed to do it because I didn't have a world-class sled. The next best thing I could do and be able to acquire by myself was uh, a set of world-class runners because um, I couldn't, I couldn't, I can't afford to buy a sled myself. Because that's you know between twenty-six and fifty-two thousand grand. But I can get myself a set of five thousand pound runners, which will definitely give me that sort of foot in the door to be competitive at least. I take it runners. You mean like the skid <coughs> on the? <clears throat> They're the metal blades that go underneath the sled. Mm -hmm. uh, that are the only thing essentially that stay in contact with the ice, other than the brake. And if you're on your head, are they razor sharp or? Uh, I mean, no, 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 not at all. They're blunt as anything they're just hardened steel but you polish them up in such a way that they become sort of um from going really dull which is slow to uh, mirror shine polished which is as fast as they can go and you sort of go from 100 grit right down to diamond paste uh, making it as shiny as you possibly can wow <coughs> and have you competed with uh, military forces from around the world uh Yes, last year, actually, there was a few Americans. Uh, in the international game, it's full of, it's full of policemen, firemen, army, navy, air force, from all the different very, uh, various um, federations and countries. Mm. So, I mean, I mean, I'd probably say uh, the military is probably the backbone of all, all the forces, uh, all the um, countries. Obsolete, to be honest. But it fits, doesn't it, with our <clears> mindset. <throat> yeah. It's that teamwork. You have to go full on into it from the beginning. There's no mucking around, you know, there's no pussy footing around. Then you yeah, got absolutely. Then you're there, there's the three say three of you, you're in a team, everyone's got to do do their bit. Um, and you're hurtling down what what speed can you pick up? It varies in all the tracks. Uh, so the last track we went to, uh, which was Koenigsee in uh, Bavaria in Germany, um, we were sort of hitting, we are only doing sort of like 94, 95 kilometres an hour. And that's because it was the end of the season. The ice wasn't uh, fast. It was quite, well, it was very humid. It was warm. I think it was 11 degrees on race day, you know. Um, but all the tracks vary in speed. So some tracks like Whistler in, in uh, Canada, that's the fastest track in the world, and you can pretty much, in a four-man, get 100 miles an hour. Wow. My yeah, God. but some tracks, like Koenigsee, which is one of the slowest tracks in the world, but it's very technical. Um, you sort of do, I think, 70 miles an hour, maybe, something like that. But yeah, Whistler's the, uh, is the game changer. That's the speed track, by all accounts. Yes. And the, so, Ads, the guy, the, if you're in a three-man and the guy in the middle, what, what's his role? So four-man, obviously you've got the driver, which is number one. Mm. Then you've got the guy behind you, which is number two. Then three's on the other side and then four's right at the rear. And they, the guys behind you, so two, three, four, uh, two, three on the side handles and four on the, on the back handle, they are literally there to give you the fastest momentum push that's, that can create the velocity to get you in a good stead to get a fast time, uh, and then it's down to the then it's down to the driver to make that velocity into top speed and get down quick. Uh, yeah. Without without a fast start, you might as well not turn up. You have to have a fast start, mm. uh, otherwise it's just, it's just not worth it's, going down. It's pretty much the same for any sport that goes down on, on snow or ice, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's gravity at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And the handles are the things that you push on the side and then they fold down in, don't they? Yeah, there's little levers inside. So when, they, when the guys jump in, they pull the levers and they, they fold back in, yeah. And what's... What, do, you, do you get drug tested and all this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's fully kosher. Um, so I think the guys in Bath University the other day actually got drug tested, but um, you always get signposted and... Uh, at uh, international competitions, particularly, sort of, I think I think the test pretty much top two or three every time. I think, uh, especially at the World Cup. But yeah, the, um, 
drugs cheats are around and you do get drug tested. Uh, off the cuff, they'll just turn up and say, right, you go in this room. Uh, we're taking a sample. Wow. And there's actually, there's actually a whereabouts app as well. So uh, you basically say where you're going to be between certain times of the day, um, 24-7 basically. Mm. Uh, and they can, turn up, they can turn up at your house and then they yeah. wait there until you need a wee. You don't have to answer this if you don't want, because I don't want you to get anyone in trouble. But do you think there are teams that... Oh, one second. Do you think there are teams that find clever way around the... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, same with any sport. There's somebody out there who's cheating all the time. Yeah. You know, look what happened in cycling. Look what happened to the Russians in uh, Sochi. You know, there's always someone out there who's, who's doing the dirty in any sport. doesn't matter if it's bobsleigh, sprinting. There's always someone who's who's cheating who just hasn't been caught, and it is just a matter of time before they get caught. Yeah, that makes your achievements all the more better, isn't it? Because I know I know about steroids. My God, you know, mm. there used to be this notion in the old days. It was a, like an urban myth that as long as you train hard and you eat right, you can compete with the steroid. And it's like, no, you you. You you can't take steroids for for three weeks. You literally double your strength. It's ludicrous to suggest. This is obviously mm. why why people use performance enhancing drugs in sport. But um, so that, yeah, that means what you've achieved is. I mean, because you've probably been up against people that are cheating. Possibly, and... yeah. Possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, it's just one of those things. Um... Will the will the Olympic Committee or sport ever let drugs just become a way of life? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But yeah. as it stands at the moment, it's illegal. You're not allowed to do it and you get a hefty ban um, if you do do it. Uh, I, I think if you get caught, you, you should be banned for life unless you've taken a medication which, which you haven't realised. It's banned, but has it given you an, an edge against someone? If, as soon as you start taking steroids, mm. you're one. You're taking that for one reason. That's to to get uh, in, to stay injury free, to get stronger and have an edge over your competitors. So therefore, you're cheating straight away. If you're unknowingly take, taking something medical that you've not realised, uh, well, one you should you should know anyway because you should have consulted a doctor before taking it. But I, I can sort of see the argument with letting them off or giving them a strike but in my eyes if you've taken if you've taken gear to to get one up on your competitor who's not taking gear mm. um because you're not good enough without taking it then you shouldn't be in any sport no and are we allowed <clears throat> to in, again don't have to answer this but are we allowed to talk about ash is that is that ash, um, ash, ash Ash was on the team, wasn't he? Um, oh, Ash Morris. Ash yeah. Morris. I, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he just didn't go to trials again. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he's just, he's about to leave the core anyway. Oh. Uh, so he wants to get his life in check. Yeah, because Ash is a very nice guy. I met him when At I was... At the gate I, of 4-2. Yeah, 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 I was going to bring that up. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, you were doing your crazy run, weren't you? And he said, I've just met Chris Thrall at the front gate. <laughs> yeah, it was quite funny. Um so for people listening at, at home, I, when I <clears> ran the length of the country, I made a special uh, pilgrimage, as it were, to run up Killer Hill at 4-2 Commando, which is a legendary, yeah. um, almost mountainous road. And it really is probably one of the steepest roads in the country. And any commando at 4-2 has to run up that on a regular basis. And even sometimes we'd get to the top and the PTI or the guy taking the session would go, right, fellas, everyone back down. Back, back down and <laughs> then you do it again, right? It used to kill me. You know, it used to absolutely be almost an impossibility to run it without getting to the top and feeling like you're going to die. And yet after uh, running almost a thousand miles, carrying a 15 kilo backpack, I just ran up it, making a video, talking into the, the, the camera. It was, a, it was a tribute video, really, to a chap called Gilly, who we lost in the second week of our uh, Northern Ireland tour. And um, I think someone messaged me and said, oh, I bet all the boys are going to give you a massive 
welcome at the top of the hill. But and I replied, no, I haven't told anyone. I, I'm not here to mm. bother anyone. I'm just making my way quietly down to Land's End. And and so I ran. I think I took a photo <clears> of the camp. Probably not supposed to do that, but I did. And um, and then off hey, I went. Yeah, I'm 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 heading down to Cornwall and on Bickley Lane, which is the anyone who's been in four two knows um, Bickley Lane. This car stopped, and the driver went, "Are you Chris Frew?" <laughs> so and that was Ash, and he said, "What can I get you? What can I get you?" And I'm like, "Oh, mate, I'm all right." He said, "No, no, I've got to get you something." I said, um, "Pasty." All right, I'm on it. And a cup of coffee? Yeah, please. <laughs> and he bombed down to the, I think it was a stripey's mess, and came back with all this. Um, and he was very kind. He said if I wanted to go out to uh, Austria and, and, and have a go in a bobsleigh, and, and he'd sort it all out, and which in another lifetime, if I had more time, I'd absolutely love to have taken him up on that offer. Well, the offer's there anyway, especially with the inter services. Just pop up and, and come see us. Yeah, absolutely. You'll be able to jump in a sled with us. Oh, mate, that's so kind of you. I, I, I would love to maybe try and get my producer to come so we can do some filming. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so my experience was I always think I was boarding in um, Lillehammer, right? And capital of Austria is that Innsbruck or am I? It's in... Yeah, Innsbruck is Innsbruck is where the track is. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure it was Lillehammer. I've, I've obviously boarded all over Europe, so get a bit confused <clears throat> after ten years of doing it. But um, yeah, so I I hopped on this bus, signed up to go and do the bobsleigh. I was the only person in our, our party. We had 10 or 15 boarders and no one else wanted to do it. And this has been a story of, of um, my life ads, right? Is if I get the chance to do something I've seen on the telly, that's amazing. It's happening. I, I'm, you're not going to talk. I don't, if I have to go on my own, I don't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that was it. I think um, I took a few beers on the coach with me and just enjoyed the trip and, then when we got out and you, you, like I said, it was a bit of a cattle kind of, you know, get in, right, off you go. And it was all over in yeah. probably 25 seconds or something. But you did get to experience that thrill of thundering down a track. Yeah. It's uh, the most exhilarating 60 seconds of your life, isn't it? This is Pretty special. Gonna, yeah, this is what I was going to come on to. Can you describe what, what was it like the first time you went down. Did you do the full track or do you? Yeah. So, I mean, one of the first times I ever went down was with John Jackson, who's the Olympic medalist and the GB1 driver. Um, I was in the back with him and I, obviously I got the platinum experience because he's a world-class driver. So he didn't really hit any corners or, mm. you know, get banged around or anything. But because your head is in, in between your legs, when you go around the high pressure corners, like the Chrysals and the big corners, um, your head sort of gets sucked into the bottom or you, you get folded in half. And like you get out of the bottom and you, I think the only way of like sort of describing it is sort of being in a washing machine, you know, regardless of if you're with a world-class driver or not, you know, the only difference is you get banged around if you're with a novice, uh, as well as not really knowing where you are at, at, at times. But when you're driving, because you're upright anyway, you don't really feel it. Uh, it's sort of, just driving a car fast, really, racing a car. Um, you, you don't really feel the sort of G pressure, the G force and pressures as what the brakeman particularly feels. He feels everything three, four times as much as what the driver would do for sure. What's the, what are the G, what's the G force on that? Do we know? I have no idea, but I imagine some of them are quite big. Mm. Um, you know, um, yeah, so uh, you hear stories of people getting out the bottom who've never been in, been sick and all sorts. Uh, and is it... Look at ha look at Harry's Heroes. Uh, they they took Harry's Heroes down um, the Bobsleigh the track in uh, Koenigsey. Uh, and old Harry got out the bottom and he was like, he just didn't know where he was. You know, some of them were trying to be sick everywhere. It's uh, yeah, you, you need bits. I mean, for us in the military, yeah, let's sound, let's give it a go. Let's just jump in, you know, get out the bottom. You know, that was amazing. 
know, some people are probably like, no, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> Especially if you get motion sickness. And, it, I mean, it really is, what, what do you guys do when you've done your training? Do you all go for a pint or, or do you have to sort of keep it all, all above board? And um, I mean, after, after competition, yeah, absolutely go for a pint, enjoy yourself. But, I mean, training week particularly, and when, you, when you're trying to be at the top of your game, like, boozing just ain't ain't going to cut the mustard like no no it writes you off for two or three days yeah. straight away it's, um, it's, the reason i mention it is military tradition culture is just get smashed yeah i mean i mean i mean at the end of the day it sort of comes down to safety like if your driver is drinking heavy and then you expect to jump in the back of him and he's got to, it's like sort of drink driving it's sort of like nah you went nah it's not yeah. good it's not you lose, you lose your edge, don't you, as well? You lose that, you well, know, rate, rate. So, yeah. So, yeah, and you're going to put someone's life at risk, you know? Mm. I mean, you think, well, oh, obviously, you just turn on your side and just hide in your sled. People get seriously injured, like, seriously injured. Like, for, for instance, last year, um, Ash had a particularly bad crash. Uh, he sort of got smashed up so badly, his like, body went into shock, he ended up in hospital for a few days, and his brakeman punctured his lung. He was put in intensive care. So it's, you know, it can go from being quite a easy, you know, soft crash to something real serious. You know, and there's been some serious in incidents before. Yeah, I mean, I know people have died. I don't know the name. Is it called the Luge when it's a one man? Yeah, yeah. It was, um, I think it was 2010 and it was the Georgian Luge athlete who basically came out of a corner. He went into a corner late, I think. And it flipped him out and he left the track and basically wrapped around a, one of the steel girders that holds the, the roof up. Yeah. Has anyone died, not... in, died in the bobsleigh over the years? I could not tell you, actually, but there's definitely been people who've been knocking on the door getting injured. Um, there used but to yeah, be a, I'm not sure. There used to be a famous clip. This is even before the days of YouTube, really. So it was like a TV clip where one team, my God, they didn't just lo lose it. And I don't know if this is, I'm assuming this is normal, but they then had to go down the whole of the rest of the track upside down with their heads just grinding against the yeah. wall. That's what you wear a, sa a safety helmet for, a motorbike helmet. But yeah, there's, I mean, for instance, one of the best drivers in the world, Nico Volta, um, he actually crashed on, I think, corner three in Lake Placid, America, and that's a twenty corner. Um, that's a twenty corner track. He went down seventeen corners upside down, and I think I think he did go back up at one point and finish the, the, the track off. But yeah, if you crash at the top, you're going all the way down unless mm -hmm. one of the corners kindly puts you back on your runners, and you're not hiding and you know to get back up and start driving again. Mate, I feel honoured. We're talking about all the places from my. Lifetime, all the famous yeah, yeah. locations yeah. and <laughs> gosh, Lake Placid, yes. And have not you... much there in Lake Placid, not much there. That's pro probably a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep, yeah, keep the focus. Yeah. And have you? What's your worst crash been? I've been quite lucky, really. So I've only crashed three times, and they have been pretty soft crashes. To be fair, they've sort of. I've just gone into a corner a little bit too late or I've not steered off it enough and it's just sort of nicely rolled me over. I've never gone off an end of a corner and sort of left the ice and plonked back on it. Um, yeah, they've been, I mean, touch wood, yeah. I've had okay crashes. I mean, both times we got out of the bottom. Uh, every time we've got out of the bottom, we've been sort of like, you're right, yeah, sound. Even had a conversation in the back of each other saying sorry to each other, actually. Uh, they've been quite... I think quite fine. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But it is only a matter of a time before you have a big crash. That, that's fact. You know, when you're pushing, when you're pushing the limits and you're trying to find that extra speed and time, uh, knock off the time, you know, it's inevitable you are going to crash at some point. And, you know, it could be at a very hard track like a place like Altenburg. You know, one of those corners could real, really bite you. Um, so, yeah, it's just a matter of time. It wouldn't be right to finish our podcast without mentioning that classic film. <laughs> <You> <laughs> Do you know, know, if I had a pound, if I had a pound for every time that film was mentioned, 
<laughs> I would not need sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> so cool runnings for our friends at home. I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think there's part of that film where they intersplice some of the actual original footage or, or they put it at the end. Yeah. It's quite yeah, yeah. a powerful, quite a powerful, um, I don't know if juxtapose is the right word, but quite powerful positioning. Um, so the Jamaican bobsleigh team. So true story. I know the Jamaicans very well and their pilot is actually in fact in the RAF. Uh, and in the he's, RAF. He's in the RAF, yeah. Yeah, he's, this, this he's called Sean Wayne guy, Stevens. This yeah, is the guy from the class. team, the original team. No, 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 no. This is the current GP pilot, oh, okay. uh, current Bob, uh, Jamaican pilot, yeah. Yeah, so they are still around and they've got world class kit now as well. So, and they've got very fast brakemen. Yeah. So they could be, you know, there's, they've got all the potential in the world of those guys. And they did so well against all the odds. Everyone said there's no way a country, yeah. an island with no snow can achieve. And, yeah. and then they, was it they crashed? I don't know if it was the final of the Olympics, but. Oh, I can't remember. I can't yeah. remember. They, they were doing ago. so well and everybody in Jamaica was like, yes, yes. And, th and then they crashed and they picked up the bobsleigh and carried it. <laughs> well, you do well to pick that up for real and uh, put it on your shoulders, that's for sure, because they're heavy bits of kit they are. Yeah. I don't know if that's something, maybe someone can put in the comments whether that's genuine or whether they did that for the for the film. No, that, you know? that was for TV, I think. Because, um, I mean, for instance, a two-man bobsleigh is sort of 230 kilograms. They're pretty heavy, or 210 kilograms. They're pretty heavy bits of kit. Um, you know, do that on ice is pretty special. Listen, come come back on a podcast and tell us how you're getting on. Um, Absolutely. Let us know where, where you're going to, when, wh if you're going to be training mm -hmm. uh, in, in some winter time, so January to March or whatever, let us know where it's going to be. And then I'll try and get the guys, to, we'll go snowboarding there. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, definitely get something in the calendar for that, mate. So just stay on the line while I say say my goodbyes. Thank you ever so much, mate. Um, like I said, it's a dream come true for me just to hear stories like this and, and stories, not the right word, but experiences. It's I'm uh, I'm glad you're smashing it, mate. I really, really am. And good luck Thank in you. the future. Keep your head down, as they say. <laughs> 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 and um, to all our friends at home, massive love to you all. Thank you for watching another edition of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. If you could like, subscribe and share, especially around the, the military pages, because I think there's a lot of people that um, would be interested. What I'll do, um, Adam, if you can give me your links, so I'll put your LinkedIn and, and any way people that can support you, I'll put that below the video. Um, so hope that helps in some way. That's it. I'm going to shut up. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. Hello, friend. I hope this finds you well. My name's Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marines commando, and I fought my way back from chronic trauma and addiction to live, work, and travel in 80 countries across all seven continents, achieving all of my dreams and goals along the way. Now, I pass my simple system on to other people, but I can only help you if you like and subscribe. So please do so because you get one life and if you live it right, one is enough.